Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning. It's good to good see morning. You. Good morning. Good to see all of you. All of you. All of you. I am giving us just a moment to um, to get settled in, take a deep breath, and um, just sit back. And we're gonna start in just a second. I just want to. Um, I said I would allow people in. Um, until around 11.10, so I'm just gonna give us a little bit of time to settle in. And everyone is sharing how cold it is where they are. We have snow, we had about three to four inches snow last night, so we in Tennessee are getting a little bit of a cold blast after it seemed like spring was ready to happen. It always happens in March before it finally gives over to spring, so welcome. Take a deep breath, settle in. If you see someone here that you wanna say hello to, please do that. Um, I think we've got people from the Netherlands, LA, New York, of course, Tennessee, uh, Illinois, Chicago is, uh, um, um, some of you are from Chicago, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Happy Saturday. Thank you for coming in. We're gonna have uh, Ryan Peterson join us. Uh, in, in about 30, 40 minutes. Um, today, I want to talk about your magic, your abilities, your tribe, your crew, um, because yes, someone's saying hello from New York. Hi, Bridget. Um, so today is twofold. One, talking with you about your process, your writing, but secondly, and I hope you guys can hear me when I say this, I need days like this as well because I love to connect with you. There's so much that I get back from you. And so I love to have a day where I can just open it up to anyone and everyone so that we can just show up, be here for each other, have a community of creatives, um, I would rather talk about songwriting with with a, a group of people like this today than do pretty much anything else in life. So this is um, a treat for me. This is a joy for me to have a day like today where we can sit and talk about um, songwriting. Some of you are coming off of a, a intensive in um, February. We had a couple of great intensives. There is a year long intensive going on, which meets once a month. And I have really enjoyed that energy. We've had January and February and March will be the last Monday of the month. I love having year long goals. I love having month goals and weekly goals. So that was a new thing I started this year is having the year long intensive. And by the end of the year, we will have talked and discussed and edited and worked on 12 songs and for some of you that felt like a big task and now that we're kind of in the middle of it um i think you guys are starting to see it's possible to write and um record 12 songs in a year so with that said i'm gonna let our last group in and uh, then we're gonna we're gonna get started we're gonna get started Want to give everybody time to get settled in. I see names: AJ, Adrian, Anne Marie, like Ariel. Hi, New York, showing up today. Um, so it's good to see all of you. And um, I am uh, just okay. I think we are ready to get started. All right. Okay, North Carolina showing up, love that as well. Uh, okay, when we talk about um, your magic, we're gonna go down a couple of different roads and talk about that. But as of today, you are magic. Like there is no looking outside of yourself for what is going on. 
Um, you have all the power. You have all of the tools that you need to show up fully for yourself today. Each one of you are in a different place on your journey as a songwriter, as an artist, as a musician, an engineer, um, all different paths that lead to a creative life, okay? So you showing up your very best self, you have that already. You don't need to pay for anything to do that. You don't need to read more books. You don't need to have to educate yourself anymore. You don't need to take one more guitar lesson. You don't need one more songwriting lesson. Just settle into the fact that you are a creative. You are magical. You have all the tools you need to be you, right? That all exists right here within yourself, okay? So, I want you to ask yourself, I am a blank songwriter. My strength as a songwriter is this. My weakness as a songwriter is this, okay? If you're taking notes, start to write these things down. My strength is this, okay? And be very honest. My weakness is this, and be very kind. Honest but kind. Start to look at yourself as a machine. What does your machine have? What strengths do you have? And then what things do you want to work on because you see them and feel them as a weakness, okay? For me, as a songwriter, my strength is I'm a starter. I have millions of song ideas started, right? I get an idea, I write it down, I keep it organized. Um, and, and so that's my strength. My weakness, if I were to have to broad stroke this, my weakness is finishing. I have a hard time finishing work sometimes. It'll sit there not finished and I keep tinkering with it, tinkering with it, and I never wanna call it done. So I have given myself some new set of rules this year in that I start something and by the end of a day, I try to find a stopping point. Where can I pause this work and listen to it for a few days before I start back in? Because if I don't, I literally just keep working and keep working and keep working on something until I start to hate it. So those, those are two of examples of my strength and my weakness. You have different strengths and weaknesses, and I want you to talk about that. We've talked about this many times, the triangle. Who of you are lyric writers? Who of you are top liners? Who of you are productions? Okay, so I'm going to let someone in who just popped in. Lyric writers, top liners, production. Now, it doesn't mean that some of you are not all three, okay? Some of you love to write lyrics and top line and your producers. When I ask you to look at this triangle, what I mean is, what do you reach for first? Do you reach for a bass guitar? Do you reach for an acoustic guitar? Do you reach for your paper and your pencil? Do you reach for your computer to start doing a beat? Do you start wanting the tempo and the, the vibe and everything? Do you want to create that? Okay. So what is it you reach for first? That is probably your most comfortable place. I usually have an idea that is a title hook concept. I don't always write the whole lyric out, but the idea is usually what I bring into the table first. What I bring into the room is a concept, a lyric. That doesn't mean it's necessarily the hook or the title. And sometimes we get very obstinate. We have an idea that is a concept and we want that general idea to be our title. Sometimes the concept is not the title. It just brings you to the title. We're going to talk about hooks and all of those things in just a bit. 
but your lyric, then those of you that are always humming and you're always getting your phone to put down a little melody idea, a little, a little dip or, you know, you know, this little sparkly thing and you go, Oh, that's a cool melody. And you put it down. That's your top liner. That's your person. That's always thinking melody. Some of you are musicians and you come up with an interesting chord structure. Okay. That can aid in the top line world, but it also is part of production. Your instrumental hooks, your beat hooks that you work on. That's more in the production, your, uh, your arrangement, your key, your tempo, all to do with production. I had a student who took a class from me and he was a guitar player and was working on his degree in music business and management. But every day in class, he would bring in a guitar and he would play these little musical hooks. And so one day I just said, you know, have you ever worked on writing songs? And he said, oh, I'm not a songwriter. I just love to noodle around on a guitar. Well, some of those hooks that he was playing were really cool. So he started getting together with some of the other writers in the class and, and taking those melody hooks that he had and turning them into a song. Because a song needs a lyric, it needs a hook, it needs a title, it needs a top line melody, it needs melodic hooks, it needs lyrical hooks, and it needs production. There is no one of the side that is more important than the other two, right? All three sides need to exist. Maybe your ability lies with playing really cool bass licks chord structures, playing a piano, playing a guitar, playing a mandolin or a, a, a ukulele, whatever it is that you're bringing into the room, that can be your starting point. It does not mean that the other parts are not important and it doesn't mean that your part is less important. It's all important. It's important for you to see where your comfort is so that you can lean on that, right? So you can lean on that. I want you to ask yourself, I'm willing to co-write, yes or no. Match your strength to someone else's weakness. If you're a great melody guitar player and you meet someone in the class or just someone out in the world that's a great lyric writer, you guys need to get together. Every lyric needs a great melody. Every melody needs a great lyric. And I believe every song deserves a good solid production. Then double down on your strengths and your weaknesses. Okay. What you do well, keep doing that well and adding to your toolkit. Clear out all resistance. Those of you that know me know that I talk about the war of art over and over and over and over because resistance is our greatest enemy. All of the voices that tell you you can't or you shouldn't or you're not good enough, shut those voices down. I am not a great singer. I am not the best keyboard player, piano player in the world. You know, I'm not the best lyric writer. All of those voices are in my head, right? And if anyone in your life has come along and like reinforced those voices, you know what that feels like. Okay. Shut that down. So in a song, we have a lot of different pieces and parts. Okay. It's important to know verses, choruses, pre-chorus, post-chorus, a bridge, one of the things I want you to always ask yourself when you are feeling like a song needs a bridge, ask yourself why is it needed? Is there more information your song needs or does your ear just want to hear a little something different? You've got your voice phrasing, make your verse phrasing interesting and different than your chorus phrasing. Make that different musically than a bridge. Make sure your listener knows when you go from verse to chorus, verse to pre-chorus to chorus, 
to post-chorus, to bridge, all the different sections have a different texture and feel and yet it all works together. Your phrasing is so important. That's why top liners are so important. The way they phrase something is part of that musical hook. Look at your time signature. Is it four, four, three, four, six, eight, two, four, five, four, ten, four? Like there are all different types of, of time signatures. Play around with that. The other night I was working on something that I had in four, four, and I was like, you know, this feels weird and I don't know why, but I'm going to pop it into a different BPM and a different, um, uh, time signature and see if I can make it a little more energized, get the feel of it, right? There is a Nashville number system. If you don't know what the Nashville number system is, I really encourage you to study. It is so simple once you understand your one is your root chord. If you are in the key of D, your one is D. E is two, F three, four, G, five, A, six, B, seven, C. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then on your eighth, you go back to your one. Okay, so if you're in a D major is D E F sharp G A B C D. Okay. That is your one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You can have a one, four, five song, which means it's a D G A song. If you have, um, one, two minor four, it's a D E minor G. Okay, when you look at a number chart, that is the national number system. And the reason they started that is you would have these songs written out in a chart and you show up uh, uh, Jerry Kennedy and some of our, our just classic uh, country producers. They did a lot of like orchestral pieces. If you listen back to some Patsy Cline work and things like that, Willie Nelson early work. Um, you would have an orchestra. So they would have the song all charted out for their people. And then the artist would be like, oh, I really need this to be a half step lower. So all of the sheet music had to go out the window and they would have to rewrite it. So if you do the number system, all you do is identify your one and you can move it up and down anywhere you want to. If you write the one as a D and then you change it to an F major, then a one is your F. It's a beautiful system. Familiarize yourself with it. Um, one little piece I want to say, sing it like you would say it. Some of you talk to me just talking like this and you've got this flow of language and then you start to sing and you kind of change the way you you say or do things. So try to, to naturalize the way you sing something. Don't sound so written, sound relaxed and natural. This goes back to you are the magic. You are the magic. So rely upon where you're from, what your natural language sounds like and sing it like you would say it. Now you can bump it up a little bit. If you kind of, if everything is just a one, two, three, four, one, two, you can then make the rule of language go a little faster, a little slower, a little, you can slow it way down, sing it the way you would say it. Sometimes when you're excited, you get really fast and you talk and you did that. Okay. And then sometimes when you've got a little lower energy, you slow it way down and then you just want to be very deliberate. A melody in a song is like a conversation. Sing it the way you would say it. Building a song, your hook idea, what voice are you in? Are you in first person? I, me, my, are you in second person? You, or are you in third person talking about he and she and they? You're omniscient looking over the storyline and you were telling about these characters. Okay. So you need to know, and don't mix those up. Don't do like 
verses in first person and then go to third person in the chorus. Then we lose perspective. You have to bring your audience along with what you're talking about, okay? You can have the voice of a character. You can have the, uh, a duet, a true duet are very rare where the lyrics actually work together as a duet. Story songs tend to be telling about these characters moving along. Is it present tense or is it past tense or is it future? Sometimes within a song you want to tell about the past. My grandpa used to tell me this and now I do this. And in the future, I'm going to tell my kid this. Okay. You can use the past, present and future as a moving through a story, but you got to make sure your audience is understanding as you move along who, what, where, when, and how. It's just like any writing anywhere. You're writing short stories, you're writing fiction, you're writing um, a paper, prose, poetry. Who is in the story? What are they doing? Where are they doing it? When are they doing it? Is it 1936 or is it 2025? Is it 1800s? Probably not. But is it 2019? That's still the past. Or is it going into the future? 2019 had certain words to it, you know, that are time stamped. Okay, so know in your mind what time this is. Where is it? When is it? How is this happening? Like, give us some of the details. Nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs. You need one unique word every seven to nine seconds. If someone's running across the street in that little line, maybe they're sliding across the street. Maybe they're skipping a across the street. Maybe they're skipping across the boulevard. Maybe they're sliding across the boulevard. Maybe they're drifting across the dirt road. So sometimes we have a line that is very, it works. You're running across the street. You can get those lines out of you and tell the story, but then go back and read your lyric top to bottom and start looking for ways to have unique words every seven to nine seconds. Some of you are counting syllables. So to say that you're walking across the street and then go to skipping, you can do that. It's still two syllables. But if you say walking across the street and then you say, skipping across the boulevard, you're like, I can't do boulevard is too many syllables. Then you could say, run across the boulevard. You can take a syllable from somewhere else and, and shift it around. Okay. Nouns, verbs, adjectives are those words that describe the nouns An adverb describes the verb. So if you're running, if you're running slowly, that's an adverb. Okay, so look at your lyric, read it down, find ways to create unique words every seven to nine seconds. Um, your hook, your title, that is important. It is the most important line in the song. It is the core of what you've written. The line before the hook is the setup line. The line before the hook is just as important as the hook itself. Okay. The line before the hook is just as important as the hook itself. And then read your hook, read the line before the hook, then go back and every single line needs to point you toward the hook. If a hook, a title comes out of nowhere, you may love that feeling of like, ah, gotcha. Okay. Like, oh, you didn't see that coming in songwriting. If you want people to remember your flow and your train of thought and your story, 
it needs to kind of have some logic to it. Okay. Now I understand, and I'm going to say this clearly. I hope you hear me. I know that I am coming from the national songwriting community. I learned from national songwriters. I have so many young friends, 18, 20 year olds that are writing songs and they don't follow a lot of the same rules because they're coming from a very emotional place, a very honest place, and they don't feel the need to have a hook or a title the way I do in my learning and growing up as a songwriter. So I'm leaving room for all people of all shapes and sizes, right? If I hear an incredible song and the hook is not exactly clear, I'm still going to let them know I think it's an incredible song. Okay? I am not saying I'm right and everyone else needs to follow what I say. I'm telling you some things to work on that I feel like will help you be clear. Because let's go back to the why we're doing this. We have something that we want to talk to people about. We have a story to tell people. We have a message. Okay. So we're trying to get our skill set up so that our messages can be clear to people. So your hook, the line before your hook, and then go back and read so that every line matches and points you to that hook. Okay, I'm going to go into something today that I feel like is very important. Many, many questions I get is, how do I demo songs? How do I record songs? And some of you uh, come to Nashville and you spend upwards of $800 to $1,000 per song to record. I completely support you. If that is what you want to do, great. That's awesome. Okay. Not every person has that ability. Here's what I want to talk to you today about is if you are looking for ways to up the value of yourself as a songwriter, there is what we call a work tape, which is usually just a voice memo on a phone. Then we go into demo. And then a master is what you call when you are releasing a song out into the world. Okay. So those are just three words to be familiar with work tape, demo master. Okay. Not everyone is looking to put a song out. So they're not needing a master. They want a documentation of their work. Look right here. Use what you have. Use what you have. We have this mentality that we don't have enough. So that little piece of trying to get a work tape into a demo, which can cost 800, 1000, 1200 bucks. That is not doable for all of us. It's not doable for me sometimes. Okay. What do you have in front of you? that you can work on getting your work tapes, your demos to sound better. If you have GarageBand on your MacBook Pro, I encourage you to do a couple of workshops online on YouTube and learn how to just open up GarageBand. You don't even need a mic. If you do, you can get a USB mic, super simple, under a hundred bucks. Plug it in, start to get just a simple guitar vocal in GarageBand, in Logic, in Ableton, Fruity Loops, Pro Tools. That's moving into like bigger, you know, DAWs than, than just GarageBand. I'm telling you, GarageBand has all the tools you will ever need to get great work tape demos, learning how to EQ, learning how to record, 
learning how to just kind of give yourself a little mix, work on your song, intro, verse, chorus, all the way out in something on your own laptop in your own house. And I promise you, adding those skill sets to yourself as a songwriter, I don't care what your level of interest is. You don't want, maybe you don't want to be an engineer. I don't want to be an engineer. I want to be a songwriter. But about eight years ago, I realized I don't want to spend a thousand dollars on every song that I write. When you're writing 80 to a hundred songs a year, that is just cost prohibitive. But there were songs I wanted to study. Is this song worth going from demo stage to a master stage? So the way I could do that is I started in GarageBand about six, seven years ago. I moved up to Logic about four years ago. I am still in learning phase. I, I did a workshop yesterday afternoon, like pulled open something about EQ and compression and sat for 45 minutes, took my notes, got back to work. And because I'm still in the learning phase, but now I have every song that I write that I want to record, I can do right here in my own space. Use what you have. Create your space. So I dug into uh, some of my notes from another class. No matter how small it is, it is sacred. Treat it with respect, protect it. Where is your space? My space used to be out of my house. About three years ago, I moved it into my house. I have a room in my house that has all my stuff around it. Very simple. It's not soundproof. That's why I work on headphones a lot is because it's not, you know, soundproof and I've got people around me. So I try not to be loud. Okay. Paint the walls, the color you want. Put the things around you that you want. Um, you know, I have my paper, my pencils. I've got, I've got, you know, a couple of computers and a monitor. I have a couple of keyboards, a piano, a rug. I finally just got a chair that I love. It took me years to find the right chair, right? Cause you get a bad chair and you sit in it for six or seven hours and your body is wrecked by the end of the day. So, no matter how small your space is, it may be a corner of your kitchen. It is your space and it is sacred. Put the things around you that make you feel comfortable, that make you feel creative. It is sacred. It is sacred. My puppy dog got in the door the other day of my room and uh, I didn't see her get in here and I got back in here and I had MIDI cables chewed up. I had a pair of headphones chewed up and it's just like, there's a reason she's not allowed in, right? It's sacred, but the door somehow hadn't latched. So lesson learned, keep your space sacred and safe. It is your space. Meet the page with who you are. Honesty, not anger. And that was a note to myself right there. Honesty, not anger. Um, this goes back to your magic. What song do you want to write today? Like, what do you need to talk about? Are you going through a divorce and you need to talk about that? You know, do you have a kid that just went to college? Do you need to talk about that? Do you, do you have a brand new kid in your life? Like, did you just have a baby? Did you know, are you a husband and your wife just had a baby? Maybe you want to write a song to your daughter for her to listen to on the day she gets married someday, whatever. What is your story? What is your magic? What stories do you want to talk about? Do you need to talk about some trauma? Do you need to talk about friendships? Do you need to talk about, you know, uh, your faith or the loss of faith? Like we all have this human experience on this planet. And we have so much in common, right? So much in common. Talk about those things for yourself. You don't need to tell your neighbor's story. You don't need to tell somebody else's story. Tell your own story. Honesty, vulnerable, 
in the language that you use on a daily basis. Don't worry about the rhyme scheme. We could go into all these rhyme schemes of, you know, what A, A, B, A, A, whatever. All of those things are things you will learn as you move along. The core of what I am about is finding your voice and your magic and what you want to say. And this goes into, um, um, this, I, I, I teach a class at MTSU in the commercial songwriting department and an article that, uh, we talk about is written by Cindy McTee. It is not feminine alone, which creates all that is a beautiful, emotional, um, hang on one second pathetic, affectionate, charming, nor is it the masculine alone which is able to produce the well-constructed, soundly organized, logical, and the complicated. Everything of supreme value in art must show the feminine as well as the masculine. The feminine as well as the masculine. If you are a male songwriter, and your songs have a lot of like movement and fun, energy, of, you know, just black and white. Here's the story, storyline. You know what makes that song special? Is when you get to that moment where you can like dip a toe into the more, uh, you know, feminine, emotional side of that story. What does that mean to you? Okay, if you're talking about a dirt road, is it the dirt road that your dad drove down in his red Ford pickup truck when you were eight years old, g driving through a forest fire to go into to the woods to tell this family that there was a forest fire? Is that what that dirt road means? Is that the dirt road where you walked to go fishing when you were eight years old? Is that the dirt road that went from your dad's house to your grandfather's house? So the story is about the dirt road. The story is about driving or walking or skipping or jumping down that dirt road. But what does that dirt road mean to you? Sometimes as females, we write about the emotional part of it, but we don't get to this to the, the details, the black and white of it. A lot of you guys get to the black and white, but you don't touch into the emotional part of it. Great art has a balance of both of those things. I would love for you guys to start to notice that in your writing, that we must be balanced in our storytelling. We've got to have both sides of that. I'm not overly sensitive to male, female, feminine, masculine. I just kind of live my life out in the world as is, right? Um, I'd rather wear a button up than a dress. I'm never going to wear a dress. I'd ra rather wear a pair of tennis shoes than, you know, any kind of like high heels or whatever. Gross. That's awful. Just not going to do it. It's not my personality, right? All of us fall in this male, female, masculine, feminine on a scale. There's not all the way over here and all the way over there. We are human beings who want connection, who want storytelling to touch us in a way that we want to communicate with other human beings. Okay? So, not every song has to be hyper-masculine, hyper-feminine. Please don't make other, the other sex be a caricature. Don't disrespect males by making them a certain type of male. Not all males are aggressive. Not all males are mean. Not all males, you know, mean somebody harm. One of the best songs I heard this year was a male artist. The songwriting was incredible. And it was a guy who went out with a girl. The storyline of the song goes out with a girl. She had a little too much to drink. And he takes her home. And he leaves her keys in the kitchen. And he texts her and says, 
just so you know, your keys are in the kitchen. I left your handbag by the bed. It was great to see you. I mean, it's a beautiful example of what I'm talking about. It broke all the rules, all the modes of what we think about when we talk about someone having too much to drink on a date. The reason I leaned into that story song is I was like, thank you. Somebody told a story that's very male, very female, but they found the humanity in the storyline. That also doesn't mean every female goes out on a date and drinks too much, right? Okay, it doesn't have to be a caricature. Look for ways to be human and not male, female. Look for ways to tell stories on both of those sides. It's so important is for us to understand each other. What you want to say is what your songs need to say. What you want to say, okay? That is a very important thing for you to focus on. What is it that you want to say? Aloneness. Writing is a lonely life, but the only life worth with living. You may not have a huge crew that is walking this path with you. You may be living in an area that you're the only songwriter you know. Part of the reason I moved to Nashville 30 years ago, in June it'll be 30 years that I moved to this incredible city, because I was in an area of the world where I didn't have a lot of like-minded people, okay? Austin, Texas was where I moved from. It was a great music town, but it was not a great songwriting town. So I physically moved myself to a place that had more of a community. But here we are in 2022 and we can get together on a Saturday morning and we can talk about songwriting. You guys can meet each other. You can put your email address out there for people to, to read and you guys talk to each other. You can get to know somebody in this class, in other classes you take. You don't have to necessarily be in Nashville to find a community that you connect with. But I want you to hear me when I say this. Being a songwriter, being a creative can be a very alone existence. There may not be other people that, ex that understands your passion and your drive. But for me and for my, you know, my career, a bad day of writing is better than a good day of doing anything else. I love writing songs so much that I would rather do that than anything. And I have gotten to where I love to be alone. I love to work on an idea. I love to, to brainstorm. I love to come up with ideas. And then when I get to be in a room with someone, which my first in-person writing is going to be March 24th in about two and a half years. And I'm very, 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 very much looking forward to it. Um, I've enjoyed the two and a half years of, of being safe and in my bubble, but I'm ready to, to be in a room with other people and other creatives. So... Writing is a lonely life, but it's the only life worth living. If you believe this, then you are in the right place as a songwriter. Comparison kills. Do not compare yourself, your age, um, where you live in the world, your skill set. Do not compare to other people. You are you. You are the magic you're looking for. You are the team that you're looking for. So start with that and then build yourself out from there. The core of who you are is all the magic that you need. How to be an artist. Make some art. Does it look terrible? Yes. Then you're an artist. Make art. Make some art. Does it look terrible? No. Then you're an artist. Make some more art. It doesn't matter the quality at first you are working on just the health and well-being of you and of the work the art the craft will get better the more you do it but the heart and soul of the songwriter 
is the thing I want to talk to. And I want to talk to about being healthy and balanced and taking good care of yourself because that is the part where you start this core creative in the middle and then you're adding layers to that as you go along. All right, I am going to um, do this so I can see all your beautiful faces. Um, wherever you are, whatever you're working on, can it get better? Absolutely. Can it get worse? Absolutely. Can it get harder? Absolutely. All of those things are true, but where you are today is where you start. You may have been writing for 20 years. You may have been writing for 50 years. You may have been writing for two months. None of that matters. What matters is where are you? Who are you? What's going on with you right now in this moment? What stories do you have to tell? What stories do you want to share with other people? Those are the things that you can dive into. Will you write a better song tomorrow than you did today? Probably, or maybe not. Who knows? It's, it's all a process. Will you be able to support yourself as a songwriter? I don't know. There are years I can say, yes, I supported myself this year with songwriting. There are years I say, yep, I didn't make enough as a songwriter this year. You know, you have songs that come out and you have high hopes for them and they don't work very well. Does it mean the song's not good? No, it just means that's just the world that we live in right? What is your measure of success? What is your measure of meaning? Why are you doing this? When I was a part of a, not when, I've been a part of a song called Invisible. It's a Hunter Hayes song that came out a few years ago. It did not make it to the top five on the country charts. I think we landed around 11, 12 and that was it. Okay. It didn't even receive an ASCAP award and you, you need a certain amount of points in a year to get an ASCAP award. I didn't get an ASCAP award. It did not earn enough points in the year that it came out to get an award. And that's a little deflating like, oh man. The letters that I get from people all over the world of what that song means to them is worth every ounce of energy that I put into the song. Every ounce of friendship with Hunter because that song came out of just a very honest conversation between us about feeling like a misfit, about feeling like the world was against you and feeling invisible. Maybe you feel invisible. I understand that feeling. The song did not get the awards that I thought it would get. It was nominated for a Grammy. And anytime you say nominated for a Grammy, that means it didn't win a Grammy, right? That's my favorite little joke about that. If you say nominated for a Grammy, that means did not win a Grammy. Where do I go to? I always look at glass half empty, did not win a Grammy. It was nominated. Where are you looking? Where's your energy go? It's so much easier to focus on the negative instead of the positive. The deal is I got an incredible writing day with one of my best friends. We sat and told stories about how we sat alone at the lunch table in middle school and high school because we didn't fit in. I wasn't a partier in high school. And so I didn't fit in with all the kids that were doing all the cool stuff. I felt like an outsider. So this is my love letter to people say, if you feel invisible, I'm going to stand here and hold a flag for you. You know, and when the world is smoky and just really loud and chaotic, look over here because I'm going to be holding a flag for you. That was my message to the world 
that day that we worked on it, and it still is my message. I'm standing here holding a flag for you. If you feel like you don't fit in, if you feel invisible, if you feel beat up, if you feel like nothing you do matters, if you feel like no songs are getting better, nothing's moving in the right direction, I'm standing here holding a flag saying, I'm in your corner, I'm your friend. I want to have those conversations with you. I want to be that word on a Thursday morning when you're just feeling distraught of you can do this. You're not alone. You have a crew around you. It just may not be obvious to you in every moment of your day and of your life. That song has done so much for me as a human, as a parent, you know, part of the reason that song was ever born is because my kid was in middle school getting picked on. And I've told people along the way, it's like, it's one thing to get picked on in middle school. It is another thing to have your kid picked on in middle school. It changes the conversation. <laughs> my kid would get into the car when I'd pick him up and I'd be like, point the kid out to me, point him out to me. And he's like, no, Bonnie, no, I don't want to come visit you in jail, right? My kid knew what's up. I was like, I wanted to kick that little kid's ass, right? Because I was just like, how can you pick on my kid? So all of those feelings went into one song one day. It didn't get in the ASCAP award and it did not win a Grammy. I'm okay with that now. In the moments, those are hard moments. You work hard every day on a song and it doesn't do for you what you want it to do. I've been there, I understand. But the message of the song is the point of why we do this, or it is for me. If you can somehow create this environment of like, create the work, celebrate the work for yourself, and move on to the next song. Clap for your own damn self, you know? They're not clapping for you, clap for your own self and move on. I'll clap for you, I'll come listen. You've got people in this classroom that will do the same. We will celebrate the moments together. Some of you are working on a chorus today and you're like, this chorus is driving me insane. That's part of the process and that's okay. Celebrate the moments. For one thing, you get to write songs. How cool is it to be stuck on a chorus, right? How cool is it to get to pick up an instrument and get to write words down on a page and try to make it all make sense? How cool is it to write a song for our kids, for our future kids, for our parents? I mean, I swear to God, I can talk to my mom better in a song than I can sitting in a room with my mom. I don't know why. You know, she and I just, we don't, it just doesn't work. But man, when I sit down at a piano, my mom's going to come sit right there with me. We communicate in a way that nobody else can help me do. I can have all the therapy in the world and me sitting down and playing a song for my mother is the best way I can communicate with her. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for you. I want you to find the ways that this world of songwriting saves your life saves your life. It will save a lot of things in this world. There is a lot of shit going on in the world. Sorry about that, guys. There's a lot of stuff going on. Sharid is going to keep me going. A lot of stuff going on in this world right now. We can save it with a song. We can save it with creative work. We can save it by being our healthy, best, balanced selves. We don't need to have the most stream songs in the world tomorrow. If you have that, 
awesome. That's great. That's a step. That's cool. You know, streaming has given us one more thing to open up and compare ourselves to other people with, right? Well, I got 50,000 spins and somebody else got 82,000 spins. Who cares? Comparison will kill the spirit that lives within you. Comparison will kill the spirit that lives within you. Don't compare yourselves. Find this place within you of what you're working on and what you love. Be the best you can be. Okay? We're all getting better. We're all getting better. I worked on something the other day and I'd been working on it for like a week. And I was so excited about this song and I was doing, uh, potentially working on a little bit with an artist named Shelly Wright. And I sent her the work tape of the song because she's going to potentially make another record next year. And I sent her the song. She's like, Oh my God, Bonnie, I love this song. I don't know what it means. I was like, wait, what? She's like, yeah, you lost me in this part over here. I was like, okay, mind blown. I thought I was very obvious. I get feedback still. I took it back and we reworked it, sent it back to her. She's like, much better. Okay. Thank you for your honest feedback, right? Thank you for the honest feedback. I'm going to work on it and I'm going to re-put it out or resend it to you. It didn't mean all that work was lost. It doesn't mean that I hate her now. It doesn't mean that I'm never going to write a song again. No, thanks for the feedback. I love it. I'm going to work on it. I'm going to edit this. Somehow, it w- the, the, one, the person talking was looking back at her younger self. She's like, hey, messed up me, you know? And, and it's, she's addressing the messed up me. And she's like, hang on, it's going to get better. And I thought I was super clear in my messaging and in my lyric and all of that. Turns out, wasn't so clear. Awesome. A day of working on that is better than like winning a marathon. A, I couldn't win a marathon because I'm never going to run that far. I always looked at people running marathons and I'm like, what are you running from? What's going on? Why do you got it? You know, we have a little group on the East side here called the East nasties and they run hundreds of miles in the year. Right. And they log it all and they all like buy their shoes at a certain place. And they, you know, they wear these little vests and they run through, you know, our side of town, like just mile after mile after mile. And I love them for it but we'll never understand it. I was just like, oh my God, I would rather be writing a song sitting in my room. But there's joy in what they're doing just like there's joy in what we're doing. It's not a sprint. It is a marathon. It is a long-term life that you're signing up for. You are signing up for I want to be a creative who's living a creative life and I'm healthy and I'm balanced and I am in love with the life that I'm living. Um, all right, I'm winding up and I'm going to, um, there's a couple of people in the waiting room. I'm going to let in. I want us to settle in, get a little break, a little coffee. If you need it, a little bathroom break. Um, If you're going to the bathroom, just uh, make sure that uh, you turn off your camera if you need to do that. And then we're going to have a conversation with Ryan Peterson, who is a producer writer. Yes, Stephen, agree. He's amazing. We're going to, um, he was going to be at his studio, but because it was uh, kind of a snowy day, he may be in his house. We're going to talk about his journey as a creative, very different than mine. And we're going to also talk about, um, how to get your work tapes and your demos the best they can be, you know, like what are some just very simple ways 
to get your work tapes to feel right and feel good. Um, all right, so hang on for just a second. I'm gonna turn my camera off and get a little coffee and I'll be right back. Take a deep breath, look over your notes. We are gonna have a little time for a little bit of a Q and A in the, in the end. Um, so be thinking about anything you wanna ask. I know some of you are coming to Nashville for 10 Pan South, which is uh, the last week of March going into the first couple of days of April. Um, I know Rona is here and, and uh, she's going to be here along with some other people. And uh, it's a great week. It's a, a week of songwriter nights that uh, the NSAI put on, which is the uh, National Songwriters Association International. So if you see anything about Tin Pan South, it's just literally hundreds of writers shows going on at the same time all over Nashville. It's a really amazing week. Um, so take a deep breath, get some coffee, take a little break, and I'll see you back in two seconds, all right? What's everyone listening to these days? All right, guys, we're back. Gonna let everybody get in. We're back, we're back. Good morning. Can you hear me, Bonnie? I can hear you. Can you see me, hear me? Yep, I see everyone. Yes, you got everybody in. We've got a great group here today. Um, we had just taken a bit of a break, so we're gonna give everybody a minute to get back in their rooms. Um, right. Did you, ha did you have an okay time getting over to the studio? Yeah, it wasn't too bad. Thankfully, it, <clears throat> every the roads are pretty okay right now, at least in I, I was only in East Nashville though, so yeah. I don't know what it's like out there for everybody yeah. else. I always I always see the pictures of people like on 24. I don't know if you saw that. Just everybody's like off in ditches and stuff. I was like, oh, 
I hate, I hope everybody's safe. It's it, Nashville is hard because we don't really have a lot of salt trucks or anything because we don't have a ton of snow. But man, when it snows, it gets really icy. Um, yes. yes. No, the, uh, the, the one and a half plows Nashville has to go around <laughs> is kind of a, kind of a bummer. Yes, it is. Well, thank you for taking time out of your Saturday to come over and, and talk to us a little bit. We've been talking about song structure, uh, oh, nice. you know, all of the things that we talk about, but part of what we talked about today is going from work tape to demo to master and how that process mm can sometimes feel insurmountable and yes. um as with most things in my life i like to simplify simplify so i can wrap my arms around it so <laughs> first and foremost i um just want to let you guys know that uh ryan is uh born and raised in la uh, had a, a dad that was involved in the music business as a songwriter, very successful songwriter. And I'll let Ryan kind of give you a little bit of his history, but uh, part of my favorites are birthday parties you had at studios with like amazing artists and that kind of thing. I'll let you kind of give a little bit of background. Uh, uh, growing up in LA, being a child of someone who's a songwriter, and then kind of when did you kind of figure out Oh, this music thing is pretty cool, and I, I, um, um, you know, I want to be involved. Give us a little bit of that story. Oh yeah, well, uh, like Bonnie said, uh, born and raised Greater Los Angeles area. I grew, I grew up about forty-five minutes north of LA in a town called Oak Park, which is like Agora, Thousand Oaks. I don't know if anybody here goes. Oh yeah, I know that. Um, but but yeah, like Bonnie said, it uh, my. Uh, I have very, now they're pretty fuzzy, but uh, memories of, you know, riding the skateboard I just got for my birthday through the control room and having, you know, <laughs> engineers kind of cringe as a four or five year old uh, was you know, touching knobs and spinning stuff. And uh, yeah, not knowing who George Clinton was, but mm. he, him trying to play basketball with me at Sunset Sound, you know, <laughs> um, but yeah, and so growing up in it, or with a dad or with a parent in the music industry was, uh, you know, interesting. It, it did give me a skewed view on success because all of my dad's friends that he hung out with were also in the industry and they were all successful. So it was sort of like, well, yeah, this seems easy. And then when I actually got in it and started doing it for myself, I was like, oh, <laughs> this is not uh in, in any way guaranteed you know yeah. um and so i would say you know bonnie you asked kind of when i knew i was like oh i might give this a try uh i started taking piano lessons when i was a kid and then i transitioned when i was in high school from playing piano to uh studying drums and i started taking drum lessons and that's kind of when i got bit by the bug i remember for christmas i got one of those really tiny probably honestly like the size of an ipad mm -hmm. uh coffee like digital coffee table recorder units i think it was a roland vs 1680 or an 880 or something and that kind of uh blew my mind while simultaneously also <clears throat> like made me realize oh wow i really love recording and songwriting and producing and and so i made a lot of horrible demos in my parents like guest bedroom in their house uh, right. all throughout high school, recorded myself playing drums. And that was kind of, that kind of kicked it off for me being, wanting to, you know, be involved in music. And I dabbled with the touring thing, but I always, as I got older, but I, I kind of realized that it was, I was more of a studio rat right. from, right. from the jump. Right. So from there, uh, you know, was a piano major in college, uh, but made my living while I was in college as a professional drummer, and then <clears throat> got a job at the Village Recording Studios in LA as a grunt. You know, your first day, they hand you the broom and mm -hmm. tell you, you know, or go unclog a toilet, and you're like, oh, this is glamorous. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember a funny story from my first day. I, you know, it's <clears throat> it's in Santa Monica, and I don't know if any of you are familiar. But West Side in Santa Monica area has really, really strict parking laws 
and you can't park on certain parts of the road at certain times. So my first you know, job was cleaning and then doing runs. So going and getting food for people. And first day I go in, Smashing Pumpkins have all three rooms fully locked out. I was like, this is amazing. And then they said, okay, we also want, you know, we need some food, some, some dinner or whatever. So I say, great. And I, I'll go get your dinner. And I go park my car and I get a ticket. And the ticket costs more than I made the entire first day <laughs> at the job. Right. Uh, Cause I wasn't aware of the, the parking laws in that part of town. So I went backwards. Yeah. I started at a loss. Yeah. Um, but then uh, from there, I worked at the village for a couple of years as, and worked my way up through the system to be more of a <clears throat> assistant engineer and then started also hanging my shingle out to be a you know freelance engineer and from there kind of ended up you know meeting and working with a lot of great people and you know from switchfoot to glee to a publishing deal with sony atv and to that all kind of led me to where i am here right now Absolutely. Yes. And um, did a lot of vocal production uh, work on Glee. Um, I, I always shudder at the idea of how many tracks you had to deal with on Glee and that kind of thing. So um, I'm going to uh, uh, let's let's dive into because production work and writing songs are a little bit different. So when mm -hmm. did um, so you're involved in studio work, playing drums, playing piano, learning how to record, learning. Mm -hmm. When did the idea that like, oh, I want to dive in and learn how to write songs. When did, and that kind of intuitiveness of like song structure and all of that, when mm. did that start kicking in for you? Initially it was with like my high school bands and, mm -hmm. and you know, I was, <clears throat> I've I was then really, but also have tried to carry through my professional career of really having a student mindset, always trying to learn, always studying, always going. Okay, like why why does that work? Why is that successful? Um, or why doesn't that work? You know, and that was initially working with you know bands, kind of original collaborators and co-writes, and trying to figure out the way to put together uh the best song song structure wise but i would say that it really didn't i didn't really like start trying to really pursue writing until i was in my early 20s but i got to witness a lot of top tier writers at the village and i mean again i grew up with a dad who was a songwriter so that i i was it was sort of around me all the time right. whether i knew what was happening or not but when I was at the village and people like Diane Warren would come in or, you know, just, just any, Dan Wilson, any number of, of, and watching how they talked about songs and talked through structure and talked about, you know, sort of maintaining the right perspective, but also uh, one, one great analogy a writer had was zooming in and zooming out. Right. You know, so really focusing on like, okay, I got to get these syllables right. I got to get these words right or whatever, but then zooming out and going, is anyone going to care if I sing about this for three and a half minutes? You know, like, I, like, you know, <clears throat> and kind of, and knowing when to walk away from an idea that's not working. I right. think that was, right. that was pretty wild as watching. I was so precious about my ideas early on and not that you shouldn't, uh, you should just throw it away if it doesn't work, but put it, put it in a drawer, you know? Yeah. That's a that's a really great chorus. I can't quite crack the code on it, but I might be able to in three weeks, three months, three years, mm -hmm. whatever. And but just how just how they they'd know they would go. I've painted myself into a corner. Mm -hmm. You know this isn't going to work. Right. And right. so watching them work through that's that's when I was like, oh wow. And you start recording it, and you get into like when I was just assistant, being the assistant engineer, and watching how they would assemble these tracks and how important it was to have like I was saying, right point of view, right perspective, the right key for the singer, you know, to help the singer shine, the right tempo to make sure it doesn't feel, you know, like the vocal phrasing is too rushed or too laid back where the listener's bored, right. you know, right. all those things. And yeah. it was, you know, I had to kind of make a mental checklist of that when I first started writing and producing, but after a while, it does become kind of just intuitive and instinctual. Mm -hmm. You start, and you don't, 
you don't think about it so much. You just know it's a feeling. You're like, oh yeah, that feels great. Or mm, that's not working. Right. You know? Right. And so I would say early twenties was when I was really aware of it and right. really started studying it. And that's, I signed my publishing deal when I was 25 or 26. Um, and I'm only 27 now, which shows you how <laughs> rough the music industry is. If you look at me, no, uh, I, no, but I was, I'm right there with you. I mean, 29, maybe. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, exactly. Um, but that's awesome. that was like, yeah, 25, 26. So I kind of had an idea of what I was doing. And then you start submitting to publishers and labels. And I mean, I had a, I had a mean publisher. <laughs> he was, right. he was not a nice guy, but it was like songwriting boot camp. And it, right. it, was, it was basically like he would, I would spend weeks on a track and he would just send a one word response. Yes or no. And it was like, <laughs> ah, whew, that was, you know, that was and rough. And that brings up a great point. I think a lot of times as songwriters and as creators, and we touched on this just a few minutes ago, we need confidence building. We need people to pat us on the back. You did a great job. And I think sometimes people feel like that's going to come from a publisher. And I have to tell you, 27 years of being in a publishing deal, I never got... Um, like that great job from a publisher. I mean, most of the time it was like, yeah, you turned in a song today. Okay, what's next? And so we, we're learning how to kind of like do the work, celebrate the work and move on to the next step, you know? So it's like, what is success? What is the things that we're reaching for? And uh, so that that's that's funny because I had I, I think we've talked about that before that you know if you're looking for the touchy feelies it's not going to probably come from a record label or from from a publisher. No, um, you you think it is because that's kind of the the apex. You know, right. it's, it's sort of like okay, well you're the you're the next the next step is the artist, and you right. might be working with that artist, and if if you're as in love with it as I am, or even half as much, it's going to be great. And they're like it yeah. can just be really a slap in the it can feel like a slap in the face but also now having done it a bunch that's not necessarily as much as i wanted it to be their job it's not their job it's it's not their job and i guarantee you, know. you when the number one party happens they will be there and the first thing they will say is i believed in this song from the day i heard it the exactly first if, if, if you want it if you want an instant good job send 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 your send your song to your to your to your mother right that's anytime i want to feel good is i just <laughs> hey mom check out this jam she's like this is incredible i'm like hell yes, yes right. it my is. day yes <laughs> it is it makes my day um so when you go from you are pretty much in your studio every day um mm -hmm. writing or working on something you've got a lot of great projects that are coming out which by the way i'm gonna tell you guys about a young artist cal stamp who uh, Ryan has written and produced the whole record. First single just came out called Hey Amy. So you guys check out Cal Stamp. I, it's just super fun uh, pop that I just, I love it. And, and people are really responding to it. Cal is a great guy. But so there was this process. Cal was wanting to make a record. He came to you. You guys worked in your studio. You did some writing. You also did some production. Let's walk through, you have a beginning song and you make a work tape. Just yes. a phone voice memo, you just like push the record button and you record it from top to bottom. Yeah, usually usually you're singing along, uh, playing with a guitar or a piano or whatever. Something to like kind of initial documentation of the idea. Right, initial documentation of the idea. That's a great way to put it. So you get this little piece of work that's sitting here. It's kind of like a seed that mm -hmm. is planted. What is your process to go from there to like, oh, I think we need to record this. Do you listen to it 20 times, 50 times, two times to make that decision? Is there already like production ideas that are happening inside your head? Go mm. from work tape to a, to the initial demo that you're doing and yeah what what does that feel like to go from that to that uh you know it can be <clears throat> with i'm gonna get i'm gonna say something that means nothing <laughs> at the same time but it can be any number of directions you know with cal for example 
he had a very clear vision of what he wanted his project to sound like. So when he sent me, I think he sent me like 16 tracks and he's like, I want to make a record from these songs. Mm -hmm. And so I played A&R and I went through and I listened and I really did stuff. I went through, I listened, I was like, tempo, lyric, this feels like your voice is straining. Cause some of his work tapes were pretty like, it wasn't just recording it on an iPhone. Like the other day I worked with a great writer friend of mine on Tuesday or Wednesday, Megan James. And I didn't, we didn't really have a track belt cause we were just writing piano vocal. And so I said, just sing it into my phone. And then if you do it a uh, quick tip, if you do it to a click track, you can then drag that voice memo into your session and yes. always have that synced up as a reference, even if you start manipulating tempo key, whatever. But if you just do it freehand, which is fine, uh, I always like to have it as a reference in my session, just to, so you can always go back and be like, am I, have I missed the mark or am I way off base from where we started? Mm -hmm. And I will even chop something up to death to align it and make, even if it sounds kind of messed up. But as long as you have a starting point of the BPM or the click or whatever, I'm seeing some of these in the comments, but yep. uh, that is a, it's a huge time saver, mm -hmm. especially cause you're, you know, you're done with the day with me it's like i always got to go get my kid at daycare or or relieve the nanny or something and it, but if i don't do that click track work tape and you don't right. document it that then i'm and then i'm like oh shit then they're gonna go cut it at home not to a click and then i'm gonna have to sit here and spend another half hour assembling right. it when it could be done in three minutes so but back to the original kind of the, the process i started with cal for example i started listening to those i picked what i thought were the best like 10 and then we went back and forth talked about again tempo key any little lyric tweaks i might have had that i was like hey i've listened to this five times and i still don't know what this part means you know and right. he'd be like oh okay i see what you're saying or no you're wrong i want to keep it and i'm like okay you know right, right. Not my, i'm not the artist i'm just trying to, to help guide the process right. but then and then the next phase comes into like you know you're demoing now the difference between demo and master, depending on how you do it, can either be 80% or 2%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I worked with a lot of producers coming up that there was like, there's no such thing as the demo, man. Anything you do is the master recording. and you got That's how you got to look at everything. Right. Uh, that has its pros and cons. Right. If you treat everything like a master, well, then if by the end of it, you or the artist or whoever you're working, the label, the manager, everyone's going, holy shit, that sounds like a master. It could be the master. And you're like, yeah, it is. On the flip side, uh, you finish it and it might sound like a master and people aren't really stoked on the song or whatever. And then it's just a demo that you poured a lot of time and energy into. So I struggle with that. Yeah, um, I, I consider that painting a car without an engine, you know, like you spend yeah, exactly. thousands of dollars on a new paint job and then you open the hood and you're like, oh, there's not an engine. There's not something driving this. Because yeah. would you would you agree that you can hear a guitar vocal, piano vocal, and know in your heart of hearts it's a good song? Oh, yes. Or a great song? Without, w without, a, without a doubt. And look, publishers, managers are going to tell you, it's got to sound like the radio, man. You got to just make it. It's got to bang out of my speakers. I mean, look, I guarantee you, uh, I Can't Make You Love Me for Bonnie Raitt did not bang out of the speakers right. when they when Mike Reed and um, Alan Chamblin, you know, played that for people. Right. It was a bluegrass demo. Right. And that's, in my opinion, that's one of like the top three best songs ever written. Ever so written. Yeah. I, I, I kind of, I'm sort of just like, no, that's fine. And if, look, I just, I also love producing. So I get into it and, you know, I, that's, that's fun for me. Yeah. Some, some people, especially if you're like, I just want to be the artist. And I just what like, I'm working with another great artist named Daniel Herr and he'll come in and he'll just be like, I don't know what the fuck I am doing. Like, I really don't. So I just want to record a piano or an acoustic guitar and a vocal. And he'll stack all these really cool vocal harmonies on it to kind of give an idea. But that is more than enough for a right. demo. Right. And like Bonnie said, I, he can play that for me. And I, I have immediately I can go, yes, that's great. Or I think that chorus is cool, but the rest of the song is kind of whatever. Yeah, it gives you just a, a kind of a roadmap to follow. You know. Well, I am going to, um, I ask people to kind of 
put together some ideas and thoughts. Uh, Adrian in the Netherlands had to go, so he said to tell you hi, which oh, okay. I've, I've told Ryan about Adrian, great guy in the Netherlands, awesome songwriter, awesome guy. Um, so people are putting together some, some questions and okay. so I'm going to kind of dig in, and um, I think Deborah had the first question that I'm going to... you ready for a few questions? I am, but real quick, if I could okay. just finish my thoughts. Oh, I'm so um, sorry. No, uh, we didn't get to the master phase. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. So, but basically, like, Daniel will bring these songs in, this artist I'm working with. It'll just be a vocal, piano, maybe a beat. He might put, like, a little kick snare thing to kind of inform tempo, a lot of times a beat and, and singing along to a track that actually has a bass, like a right. tonal center, will help you so much. Because yes. if it's sometimes if it's just a piano vocal, you can you're going like, damn, that sounded way better when I sang it. When I listen back, it's not doing the thing. Put a bass just playing the root notes and it'll make you feel so much better when you sing it. Um yes. or for the artist you're working with, you know, it's it's a weird, I was again, one of those things I saw at the village where the person didn't, couldn't really figure it out and it was kind of a young producer and the executive producer walked in and said, oh, just put a bass in. And it was like the skies parted and right. they were done in like five minutes. They've been working for three hours. Right, So I agree with that. Um, and then the jump to master. Now, if you're like me and sometimes you spend a lot of time on your demos, well, maybe the master is just a couple of mixed tweaks or maybe you used fake acoustic guitars and you cut real acoustic guitars on it or something. Right. Um, or if you're doing more of like the the kind of true demo, stripped down piano, vocal, guitar, vocal, bass, whatever, um, then you do. It's kind of the sky's the limit, you know. Mm -hmm. If you have the budget, sure, you can go to Blackbird and hire the best players in town and be in a great room. But there's um so many ways people are making master quality recordings now, and like. I mean, there's that website, Sound Better, where you can go look for players to play on your stuff. And like top tier, like Aaron right. Sterling, Sean Hurley. I mean, you name it. These guys are like the who's who, you know, what it's like when Sean's not on tour with John Mayer, you can hire him through Sound Better. It's like, right. it's a great way. And I'm not even, <laughs> I have no skin in the game on Sound Better. I just like the, I just like the concept. Um, but then it from there then you kind of you put it together with the 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 best possible players production engineer sounds you can mixer and then that is your master recording mm -hmm. you know it's just it, you, you're <clears throat> going from seed to small plant to like just it grows into like this more fully formed yeah. piece of work and exactly. Do you ever hear a, a song of yours that's a master that's out in the world and you still wish you had tweaked that one little line in the bridge? Or do you still have tweaks in your head? Every day. The Hey Amy mix has too much bass. That's out right now. That <laughs> bothers me. I hear it in my car and I'm like, damn it, I messed oh, that up. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Just, but it's out. It's, it, right. People like it. No one's listening to it going, and, and hitting me up on Instagram going, Juice man, that bass is too loud. Juice I mean, loud. now that I've now that I've said it, you guys might. But um. <laughs> so, so the point that I'm I'm kind of driving at on that is we all are always criticizing our own work. Like it's never over for me. I can still hear a song from 2005 <clears throat> that was you know one of my bigger hits, and like oh. Why didn't I like tweak that line right there? It could have been better. Mm -hmm. I don't like the way the phrasing lands. Like you are going to tweak your work for the rest of your life. But yeah, I, I think Rick Rubin had the quote and I might be, or he said it, but it's like, it's better to be done than good. Right. You know? Right. And it's like, there's you, cause you can spend forever tweak. I mean, the, my other favorite joke is a perfect painting takes two people, one to paint it and the other to shoot him when he's done. Like, <laughs> you know, that it's, is it's, so true and that's when at, we, yeah go ahead at some point you just have to let go because there's i mean that's the whole point is we are creators you want to you don't just want to create one magnum opus like yes spend the time 
you know, right about the point when I start to hate the song is when I go, okay, I, okay, like, I maybe I should, <laughs> yes. I should back off this. Maybe I should back off. Yeah, I um, earlier we looked at our weaknesses and our strengths, and my strength is being a song starter. I think I'm always mm-hmm. got ideas, but my weakness is being a song finisher. I just never follow feel through. Like, yeah, just never Oof. feel like my songs are finished, and I I I hate that feeling of incompleteness, but. I've been setting myself these goals of like only allowing a certain amount of time to work on it before I do what you said of putting it in the drawer and letting it just sit for a minute. Like, don't keep tinkering with it, you know. Because perspective is everything. That session I was telling you about with my friend Megan James, we spent like six hours and got a verse chorus. Right. And I walked away from it going, I don't know if that's it. I don't know if that's going to work. And we got back together like and we're both busy. So there was months in between we listened to it and she goes, I think our first verse is more of a second verse. And then we just, we were done before lunch. Right. It was like, yep. Oh, that was easy. But some, the zoom in zoom out thing I was talking about, we were too like in it. Yeah. When you're down we were in snow, the weeds, snow blind. Yeah. yeah. Just when you're down in the weeds, sometimes you don't see yeah. when you zoom out and you get to see the full picture of it. Yeah. And, and my one last quick thing on okay. demo to master. Sometimes, stuff you do stuff you're going to do in your demo is totally valid to keep for the master Mm -hmm. don't just because you've called it a demo don't be afraid to put it in the master because i have had more scratch vocals or whatever when people are free and easy and not overthinking it doing whatever and it's like it's that's it it's great right right you know and there's some psychosomatic stuff where you've lived with the demo for months and you try to go and you're like it's not the same and so Mm -hmm. you know Yes. uh, Agree. Natalie said it's hard to recapture the first magic sometimes when you get that down. It's like sometimes it doesn't translate. But um, but I mean, after, you know, sometimes it does. Sometimes you do. You get in there and you grind on it and it does make it better. But like uh, Jim Keltner, he says after he famous session drummer, but he's like after three takes, the magic's gone. Like that's his whole thing. He's like the hot lava is in takes one and two when you kind of don't know the song fully and you're learning it and all the everyone's looking at one another and feeding off that energy whereas there's this it just it feels you know not unsure but everyone's super focused but after you after it's kind of second nature i think people get the players in the creative process can get uh bored sometimes exactly so but anyway that's my that's my demo to master inception to you know end so hit, hit me with questions all right, Deborah. No, sorry, Debbie, because we have a Deborah. Uh, but Debbie Pinto says, Ryan, how do you, as a producer, get hooked up with the songwriter? Oh, well, um, initially, it was through. Well, uh, I'll say this: you know, if you're in a town like Nashville, or or even you know L.A., where I'm I'm originally from. Um, the the easiest way is to to go to these networking events that are happening all the time. Now I know with COVID it's kind of marred in person stuff, but there's still plenty of ways to digitally meet up. I don't know if I'm a member of ASCAP and they hit me up with an email at least once a month of oh, okay, there's this, you know, ASCAP get together at this at this bar or whatever and or there's an ASCAP writers night. Um, you know, particularly if you're in Nashville, there are writers rounds every single night Mm -hmm. seven days a week and if you go and just start hanging out and get connected with you know and 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 introduce yourself to songwriters that you like that's a really easy way to get connected now if you're not in an industry town might be a little harder but the internet is a pretty pretty magical place again there's the sound better method and uh also there's like Twitch and Discord and all these online communities that exist where you can just be a part of it and introduce yourself. Hey, I'm a producer. Here's what I've produced. You know, you would probably be surprised if you said, I'm looking for songwriters for a project, how many people would reach out back to you? Right, you know, right. Like, um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, and uh, so that's, that's one way. Another way is if you uh, have friends that are in other aspects of the industry whether it's management or publishing or even record label a and 
anyone who's in it is going to know all these people, mm -hmm. you know, no other writers. And they might even have a better kind of vetting process. Well, what, what kind of, what do you like to produce? You know, are you more, do you do this or do you do that? And then I can kind of steer you into which, you know, which direction to kind of send you to meet some writers and stuff right. like that. Right. <laughs> um, so Eric would like to know if one of us has an example of a demo that we feel like that would be acceptable to play for a publisher. And um, I think I have um, one of the Daniel songs. Can I share something like that to show kind of like where you landed, like not a work tape, not all the way to the master, but something kind of in the middle there. Um, yeah. Do you want to do you want to play them? Like, yeah, I guess you could play them. Her or um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, only only life. life. Only life. Only life. Yeah. Let me let me pull that up. And while I'm doing that, um, Marie Eve would like to know: Do you think it's possible to succeed as a lyricist if you don't play music? And um, while you while you kind of speak to that, I'm gonna pull up uh, something real quick to play. So and yeah, and it was just a question again. Sorry, was it, it cut out for a hot second? Could oh, you repeat oh. it? Yeah, she's uh, Marie Eve would like to know: Is it possible to succeed as a lyricist if you don't play music, like if mm. you're only lyrics? What what is your only lyric? Yeah. yeah, I mean. Look, lyric sometimes can be one of the hardest things to do in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and so a good lyricist is incredibly valued and valuable. Uh, it probably in today's way music is made, you might have to work a little harder to get yourself in those rooms. And because so much of it is, it's not self-contained, but it's more of, you know, you for you to succeed as just a, a lyricist, right? You have to collaborate. You're not able to, you know, play, you know, write the chords and arrangement and melodies and all that stuff, and write the lyrics. So that means you have to find a collaborator, who, you know, maybe you could even work as a team and be like, hey, you know, it's it's Marie and so and so. You know, we we come as a package deal because I I'm great at the lyric. This person's great at the you know, the chords and the melodies, and we can really help you, you know, create the song you're looking for. Um, so I do think it is possible to succeed, but it is specialization in today, the way music is made today can be a little tricky to navigate because everyone wants me to wear multiple hats. I play drums some days, I mix some days, I produce bands and artists top to bottom, I play session keyboards. Like it's, you know, every day I'm wearing a different hat. And if I only did one of those things, I would only be getting 50% of the calls that I get. Mm -hmm. So you might just have to pound the pavement harder, but I, I mean, I, I think it's possible. Yeah. And, and that's where we go back to like creating teams of people, like know what your strength is. Yeah, you know, and that's and, and, exactly. And connect with people that do what you don't do. Um, um, you know, I, 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 I think I way lean further into lyrics than I do, you know, production or anything, but, um, you know, that is the reason that I connect with people like Ryan or, you know, a Megan James, like you said, is a great singer. Daniel's mm -hmm. a great singer. And you connect with those people that, uh, um, See, Paul right here just spoke up and said, Marie Eve, I need, I have projects that need lyrics. So there are ways to meet people that, that need what you do and mm -hmm. uh, bring that to it. Okay, so I popped open and I, I don't have my Ryan file in front of me on this computer. Um, by any chance, do you have that on your computer or no? Only life? If Checking. You I can't believe that I don't have it on this computer. I was like, oh, I had everything but that. Um, and, and check that real quick and um, I'll make you co-host and that way you can share. Um, I'm gonna pull up just a couple more questions. Um, 
Ariel says, what do you recommend as a way for an artist to try out working with a particular producer before investing in a full project? Do you start with a mm. song or a demo, for example? What, what do you <laughs> suggest? Meet them for coffee <laughs> before you play a note. Um, no, I, I've learned more about just hanging out with the people because this is someone you're going to be spending a lot of hours in the room with like put the money aside you know the person's 500 1500 five thousand dollars whatever of your hard-earned cash to help you bring your idea to life if you don't connect as humans that's it's it doesn't matter how good they are you know it's that's the i mean that's the biggest thing with collaborating with people is if i can't stand to be in the room with somebody right uh, it doesn't matter how good they are yeah. and you know, or how, how good of a fit or how, you know, I remember my publisher, be like, I can't wait for you to work with this person. And I get in the room and be like, after 25 minutes, be like, okay, I mean, what, like, hey, dude, my grandma's on fire. I got to go. Like, right. I, ooh, <laughs> like you know. That's, that's great. Um, so, so, and then yeah. uh, make sure they vet them, you know, like uh, on your own and ask them, play them your demos. Hey, what do you think of this? Because also if they're great and you connect on a personal level, but they're like, hey, I don't really like your songs. Oof, that's also not going to work. Right. So, right. so I, think, and, uh, to and the, I think, and being honest, I think is so yeah. important. Like if you meet someone and you honestly don't feel like you'll work together well, go ahead and save you both some time and energy and money and effort. Because if, if, if the feeling isn't there of like true collaboration and respect, um, like I can be in the room with the best songwriter in the world and they just kind of have this condescending, disrespectful tone. I don't respond well to that, you know? So it's like they can be brilliant and it's just not gonna be something that I feel great about. So I, I do think being equally tied to someone that you you love their work ethic, but you also love the work. You know, I think that's important. Yeah, yeah. it's 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 got to be that balance because I don't think you. I'm speaking for myself here. I don't want to show up and have someone just tell me what to do, right. or, or you're wrong, or do this. Right. You want them to push you and get the best performance out of you because that's right. something a producer does too. Is they they might make you feel a little uncomfortable to to sort of get take you out of your comfort zone, and I think that's super important, but. Right. There's a difference between pushing you out of your comfort zone and being an asshole. Right. And sometimes, you know, I've we've all been there, coworker, boss, doesn't matter. And you're like, hmm, yeah. you're kind of a jerk. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really want to hang out with you. Yeah. Pushing somebody to be better is different than being condescending or toxic. I talk about toxic yeah. relationships. It's mm -hmm. just like in a relationship in life. If you have a co-writer, a producer, uh, a player in your band that brings a toxic kind of energy to everything, I don't care how good they are, you will do yourself a service by kind of cutting that out of your life. You need positive um, push and pull. Like, you know, like sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. Sometimes it's not about right and wrong, it's about, you know, but you don't want to get along to just get along. Also, you want the best product. So um, yes, say no to toxic energy. There was another um uh question here ariana i think is how to say this ariana i recently received advice that i should learn how to fully produce my songs on my own since hiring a producer can often be costly i'm learning how to make simple demos but i feel that i am more of a writer and vocalist than an engineer what would you suggest i do <clears throat> great question it's a great question well um i don't think that's necessarily bad advice hey say stay self-contained but also if you're like it's just not my thing i mean look that artist i was telling you daniel it's just not his thing right. he's like i just don't like ugh, i just want to document it and i don't want to i don't care about the kick drum sound i mean i do what i just want to hear it be done you know and that's why that's that's why he and i are working together so yes now paying a producer can be costly but there are more than one ways, more than one way, excuse me, <clears throat> to collaborate on a project. You know, you could give this producer ownership of said project, not, not full ownership, but plenty of projects that come through my door 
I'm blown away by the music, but they have no budget. Right. And you're like, okay, well, why don't we do this? You're the artist. I'm the producer. I can't afford to take you on and produce three songs for 50% ownership of your project, right. of your master. So that's why every time it gets a stream, I get a little money. And in, at the end of the day, if the project pops off and a record label comes sniffing around and they want to buy the project for X amount of dollars, then I get half of that money. Right. So there are plenty of producers who, if they like what you've got going on, are, I mean, a lot of my friends who are <clears throat> doing great stuff, that's kind of how they operate with independent artists. Right. Because, yeah, I don't, when a label calls, I have my label rate, but labels not always calling and so when independent artists walk through the door and they have a little bit of money or not enough or you know then you can there's there's a lot of ways to kind of manipulate that to make it work to your advantage where you can both get something you feel good about and you want to be a part of right um uh, <clears throat> i am um Hang on, I'm still looking at questions here. Um, Sharita, who is lovely, amazing voice, Sharita, in Florida. Hey, what's up? What's your best single tip or piece of advice for us? What's something you wish you had known when you started? And we're going to answer oh. that. <laughs> we're going to answer that. And then I'm going to find a, a Ryan um, kind of piece of work that's not a master quite yet that I can play. Why don't I just, I'll just forward this to you, Bonnie. While okay, I, cool. Perfect. It, if it, it, Baker management, is that the best one? Yeah, that's the best one. That's fine. Okay. While you talk to Sharita, I will grab uh, this. Uh... Single thing. That's a lot of pressure on that question. Right. I will say this. I wish the thing I didn't do, uh, the, uh, I don't really know the exact way to, it's, it's, it's one thing, but chase heat. I sat in a lot of meetings where people told me my my songs weren't this or that or to to this or to that, and you know I was in a relation I was in a professional working relationship with a publishing company, and so you you're you're wanting to take their advice and kind of maybe do what they say, so that they will then take your song and pitch it harder. Um, but I I. I started to realize the more I tried to make the song something it wasn't, or I tried to write something that I wasn't or produce something that I wasn't the like exponentially less cool it got. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, I don't want to say don't care what other people think. Cause that's not right, but just grain of salt. You know, mm -hmm. everyone's got an opinion on this. There's no wrong or right answer. And if someone says, Oh, it needs to be, you know, I, mean, I remember one time an A&R telling me the whole song needed to be sped up one BPM. <laughs> and I was like, for real? One yeah. BPM. One that's BPM. the deal breaker. Yeah. Like that's, that's going to be the thing. Um, and like a clown, I did it. Cause I was like, I was so desperate for that. Like, mm -hmm. please do something. And then of course, you know, the song, nothing yeah. happened with it. Right. So exactly. like just, just kind of, you know, we all have, we all have dreams and goals and desires for our song to get somewhere. Uh, but like, don't like, just keep doing what feels good to you because honestly, what is cool to you and what you're excited about, that's what's gonna make everyone the most excited. That's what's gonna make everyone notice and, and be like, yeah. And you know, not everything needs to sound like at the time, Dr. Luke was ruling the charts and it was basically like hey this needs to sound more like tayo cruz or katie perry and i'm like well no just call dr luke yeah like yeah. don't i'm not if you want a dr luke song call him instead of me trying to be uh, yeah you know the version of dr luke that i can be yeah a, a, a cat in a rabbit suit is still a cat at the it's end of the day like <laughs> exactly i love that all right guys listen up i'm gonna pull up uh a newer thing that Ryan has been working on. And um, first and foremost, Ryan, thank you for your time today. Second of all, sure. Thanks Ryan, for having me. when I talked earlier about Grammy nominated, Ryan is actually a Grammy award winner. He has it sitting in his studio that is where you can't see it. And uh, I always want him to wear it around his neck so that we know that they do exist. 
and um third, yeah, i can yeah i'll i'll, I'll i, I uh, can hold there, it and it's there it's go. up there on the corner on <laughs> on the mantle i love it um secondly or thirdly um you know ryan's manager a few years ago introduced me to ryan and we walked in and our first day we just literally talked about music and songs and um just you know just found one of my favorite people we are a great example of like we kind of came from two different worlds i had definitely been in the nashville country writing world ryan came from kind of la the pop writing world but our love of music and our our love of getting the best song possible that day was uh something that just really struck me and um i just i'm grateful every day to uh to have you in my life and i'm just grateful to have you in my creative life because i have learned so much um the art of writing a song is one thing but when you're sitting in a room that has the skill set like like a ryan he can literally take what's in my brain and put it down in in actual music and it just it feels so good to work with people that you get the vision together and i think that's probably one of the biggest gifts and i have told you guys this over and over i only sit here because of those people around me and and ryan is definitely the person that makes me better at what i do and uh so i'm i'm gonna play uh, same bonnie same yeah, i'm gonna play um only life this is a, a an artist daniel her that we both love Do you ever feel like you never end your day burning with the same fire that brought you out awake Do you ever feel like nothing ever goes the way you planned it out in your mind so why try anyway Do you ever wonder why you're here at all Does anything matter on this little blue ball question from Emily who says I've been writing and playing guitar for a while but now I'm very new to recording what advice do you give for starting out using voice memos and or garage band and simple get the songs down 
maybe pull up a couple of workshops on um, you know YouTube or whatever about EQ. Don't mm -hmm. start down the road of compression and any of those things, but just EQing your voice, EQing your guitar, just getting them panned right, and you will be stunned at how much just learning a couple of small things can help your work tapes sound a little more like you want them to sound. I just want to say that a year and a half ago, I had a day just like this, and there was a guy in the class, and his name was Daniel Herr, who is who you just heard. The first time I met Daniel was in a situation like this, and I cannot tell you how important each of you are. I can't tell you how important your community is, how important the support that you get from each other is, the messages you guys are sending is amazing. Thank you so much, Ryan, Brian, and Ariana. Everyone is, Bob is saying thank you. Everyone is saying thank you, and we both appreciate. Thanks for your time, my friend. I really yes, you are You are welcome. I'm sorry we couldn't answer everyone's questions. Yes. And real quick, to give you an, an example of something, there were some tracks in there on that last song you heard that Daniel brought me his logic session. Mm -hmm. And I just was like, well, these are great. There's no point in me trying to recreate it. So that's in that demo version. So yep. kind Daniel, of our first thing I, we talked yeah. about, sometimes if something's good, just don't, just just accept that you did a good job Yeah, and use you don't, it. You don't need to redo things just because you feel like you can. But um, yeah. yeah, Daniel definitely started in GarageBand, getting his vocal, getting his writing. He does a lot of writing by himself. And it has grown so much from there. And uh, um, boy, we just appreciate each and every one of you for being here. And it's been such a great day. I wish I could take the time to like sit and talk to each one of you, but today is not that day. Today was just a thank you for being part of this community. And uh, um, we really appreciate it. We're gonna say goodbye. And until next time, be looking for uh, you know another little email from me to just tell you to keep going keep going keep going keep writing keep writing finish your songs finish your songs keep writing much love to all of you ryan thank you i'll talk to thank you thank you all guys time. okay thank bye, you guys. both so much bye 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 aj thank you thanks bonnie